Welcome back to MCB 170, Society and the Brain. This is lecture 17, which corresponds to part one of module nine. The title of module nine is Fairness. In module nine, we'll be discussing fairness and other innate tendencies that influence interpersonal interactions. Interpersonal interactions or interactions between people can be studied in a laboratory setting quantitatively using so-called economic games. Economic games are set up, contrived, staged economic exchanges between people. And in laboratory economic games, people can win or lose real money. Probably the best known economic game is called the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, there are three actors. The participants in economic games are referred to as actors. The three actors in the ultimatum game are the proposer, the decider, and the bank. Then the game proceeds as follows. In number one, the bank provides the proposer a sum of money. The sum of money also is often called the stake. Two, the proposer offers some division of the money between the proposer and the decider. So the proposer might propose a 50-50 split of the stake. That would be a fair offer. The proposer might propose a 90-10 split, where the proposer gets 90% and the decider gets 10%. That would be an unattractive offer. Or the proposer could propose uh, a 10-90 split, where the proposer gets 10% and the decider gets 90%. That would be a very attractive offer, a very generous, attractive offer. Three, the decider decides whether or not to accept the offer. Four, if the decider decides to accept the offer, then the proposer and decider each receive the amount the proposer proposed. So if the stake was $100 and the proposer proposed a 50-50 split and the decider decides to accept the offer, then the proposer and the decider each get $50 and so on. But five, if the decider decides to reject the offer, then the proposer and the decider each receive nothing, and the whole sum, the whole stake, is returned to the bank. Now, a very important aspect of the ultimatum game, as it is usually played, usually played, is that the proposer and the decider cannot communicate with each other. They can't negotiate. They, the proposer proposes and the decider decides independently of each other. They don't communicate. They don't even have to be in the same room. They can be on opposite ends of the, of the country. They can be on opposite sides of, of the globe. Knowing that, and knowing that if the decider rejects the proposer's offer, then the proposer and the decider each get nothing, we can ask ourselves, what would we do if we were the actors in this game? If you were the proposer and you knew that you would get nothing, if the decider rejected your offer, then you might propose an attractive offer. What about you as the decider? What if you were playing the role of the decider? You would, you would probably accept an attractive offer. You would probably accept a 50-50 split, which was a, a fair offer. Would you accept an unattractive offer? Would you accept 80-20, where you get 20? Would you accept 90-10, where you get 10? You would accept any offer if you were a so-called rational actor. The rational actor of classical economic theory is a person, an entity, who maximizes their gains and minimizes their losses, and that's all they do. They have no other concern but to maximize their gains and minimize their losses. The way the ultimatum game is set up all the decider can do is decide to accept or reject the offer. The proposer proposes the decider some amount of money and the, and the decider can take it or leave it. If the decider always refuses the offer, the decider always gets nothing. If the decider always decides to accept the offer, the decider gets whatever money the proposer proposed. According to classical economic theory, the decider should always accept the offer. Whatever is proposed is better than nothing. 
how would you decide? Would you accept an unattractive offer? Do people in general accept unattractive offers? Well, here's a very interesting experiment done by Heinrich and colleagues published in Science. You can download that article for free as U of I students through PubMed or Google Scholar. Heinrich went around the world and he visited people from all these people groups, the Maragoli, the Hazda, the Samburu, the Gusi, the Asawa, the Ao, the Sursuranga. I would love to have done this experiment. I mean, they went all around the world and they played the ultimatum game with real money, with real people from all these different people groups. And they wanted to see how they would behave in the economic, in the ultimatum game. And they were interested in the rate of rejection. So all the people in all these people groups were playing the role of the decider. They were all deciders. The experimenter was the proposer. The subjects from the people groups were the decider. And they could accept or reject the offers. Each row represents a different people group. And each black bubble reflects the percentage of the group that was willing to reject the offer expressed as a percentage of the total state. So for example, in this second column here, this is the 10% column. The decider was offered 10% of the stake. All the way on the left, in this column, the zero column, the decider was offered zero, 0% 0 of the stake. And so these are all the offers in, in increments of 10%. Here's a 50-50 split. Here's the ultimately generous offer where the proposer proposes to give the decider 100% of the stake, the proposer gets nothing. Again, the dots are the percentage of the people in the people group who rejected the offer, rejected the offer. So here in the first column, terrible offer, 0, 100, the decider gets 0, the proposer gets 100%. There was a very, very high percentage of rejection. And here for the goosey, you can see for an example, that's that a circle of that size diameter was 100%. All of the people in that people group rejected this very unattractive offer of 0, 100. Okay, and so did Americans. So did farmers in rural Missouri. And so did freshmen at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. As the offer got a little better, 10% to the decider, 20%, 30%. The percentage of rejections went down for the Missouri farmers. It went down for the Emory freshmen. And by the time we get to the fair split, 50-50, the Americans were all accepting it. They were accepting the offer at 100%. At 100%. Now, bear in mind, if all of these people and all these people groups were behaving as rational actors, there would be no black dots on this graph at all. It'd be empty. For attractive offers, the Americans were accepting 100% of the time. There were no rejections for really attractive offers where the, where the share to the decider was 50% or more. And in general, people all around the world behaved that way. People all around the world tended to reject unattractive offers to accept the 50-50 split and to accept, accept attractive offers, offers that were favorable to them, where they got at least half the stake, if not more. The Susuranga were very interesting because they had a high rejection rate uh, for all offers across the whole axis. But some of the even more interesting people groups were ones who tended to reject very attractive offers. There were a substantial number of people groups where the people rejected attractive offers. They even rejected the 100-0 the split where the decider gets the whole stake and the proposer gets nothing. In fact, Heinrich showed in almost half of the cultures they studied, some deciders actually rejected offers to the decider of the entire sum. Why would they do that? That seems crazy. That doesn't seem rational. That seems completely irrational. Here's how Heinrich interpreted it. They said, they noted, 
then in some of these people groups, they had a, a culture of obligation where if a person receives a generous gift, they have to make a counter gift later on that's even more generous. If they receive an extravagant gift, they have to make later on a gift even more extravagant to the person who they received that gift from. Certain cultures are cultures of obligation. And in a culture of obligation, it might be perfectly rational to accept a very attractive, a very generous and extravagantly generous offer. But most of the time, people accept generous offers and reject poor offers, unattractive offers. What's happening in their brains when they decide to reject uh, an unfair offer? This was, look, this was studied by San Fei and co-workers in Science. A very interesting article, again, available to you uh, for free as U of I students. In an MRI experiment, you have to time out the experimental course because you want to correlate activity on brain activity as measured in the scanner with events that are occurring in the experimental setting. So here, here the time course is mapped out precisely. In the first segment, you get the subject's attention. The subject is playing the role of the decider, and in this case, fixating a fixation spot. Then a photograph of the proposer is shown, and the proposer is given a name. In this case, the proposer is Kelly. And he, Kelly makes her offer in this segment, and she proposes an 80-20 split. In this case, the stake is $10. She proposes she gets $8, and the, and the decider, the person in the scanner, gets $2. In this segment, the decider decides. And in this particular instance, the decider decided to reject. Therefore, in the last segment, the outcome is revealed. Kelly gets nothing and the decider gets nothing. The decider rejected the offer. Neither participant gets anything. The bar graphs on this side show the behavior of the subjects. Here's the 50-50 split, the fair offer. All the subjects accepted it. This is the acceptance rate on this axis. The 70-30 split, okay, well now only about 95% of the subjects are accepting it. The 80-20 split, where the decider gets 20%, the, the acceptance rate is only about 50%. And the 90-10, the proposer gets 90, the decider gets uh, 10%, rejection rate is, is, the acceptance rate is less than 50%. Interestingly, the black bars are when the subject, the decider, understood that they were playing against a human. The open bars show the results when the subject understood that they were playing against a computer. The results are kind of the same, except the acceptance rate was always higher for the computer. A person who would reject an unattractive offer, a 90-10 offer from a human, might accept it from a computer. What is this telling us? It, does, it is telling us, it is giving us a clue as to why people would reject unfair offers. It seems that they're trying to communicate something to the human by rejecting their unfair offer. They think, why should I bother trying to communicate with a computer? Okay, so what's happening in the brain? Here's a diagram we've shown before of this place in the brain called the insula. It's inside this fold this large fold here inside the brain, the insula is the cortex inside the biggest fold. Sanfei found that the anterior insula, anterior cingulate cortex, and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are more active for unfair than for fair offers in their subjects. So shown here in A, here's the anterior cingulate cortex up here. It's above the corpus callosum. Here's the insula on either side, inside that deep fold. This, is a, this, this scan is taken from further forward in the brain. Here's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex lighting up. And here's the data represented in graphical form. When the proposer was a computer, you see the dashed lines. There wasn't that big of a difference between insula activity for fair and unfair offers. 
But the solid lines show insula activity when the proposer was a human being, much higher insula activity for unfair offers than for fair offer offers. Okay, so what's going on here? We have our old friends, prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, and insula. Prefrontal cortex, controlled processes. Anterior cingulate cortex kind of mediates between automatic processes as in insula. Here's another diagram showing the controlled automatic interaction, which is central to our discussions. You see the prefrontal cortex working with in conjunction with anterior cingulate cortex to control regions of the brain that mediate automatic processes, such as in this case, the insula. So insula activity is high when individuals reject unfair offers. In fact, insula activity is correlated with the rejection rate. So here you see acceptance rate in this graph on the x-axis and activity in the insula on the y-axis. And then when the acceptance rate is high, you see insula activity is low. When acceptance rate is low, insula activity is high. Here are the data expressed in bar form. When the subjects accepted the offer, insula activity was low. When they rejected the offer, insula activity was high. Prefrontal cortex activity was about the same whether the subject accepted or rejected the offer. And so, here's how Sanfei and co-authors interpreted their results. They noted, as we have noted, that activity of the insula, they're calling it the bilateral anterior insula. It's the insula on both sides, the front part, but let's just call it the insula. Insula activity is associated with negative emotional states such as disgust. The anterior cingulate cortex is associated with cognitive conflict and the activity of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, part of the prefrontal cortex, is linked to cognitive processing, including goal maintenance and executive, executive control. According to Sanfei and coworkers, activity of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is related to the goal of making as much money as possible. In other words, they're saying that the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is like a rational actor implying that the insula is the irrational actor. So they say that a decision to reject occurs when there's higher insular activity than prefrontal cortex activity. In other words, irrationality wins. The decision to accept is related to higher prefrontal cortex activity than insular activity. In other words, rationality wins. And that's consistent with the view of classical economics, which says that deviation from rational actor models is often chalked up to emotions. So here we see the, the rational actor, the gearhead, and the emotional, fiery, irrational, real person. And this leads to a question. Emotions accompany many cognitive processes. But does an actor have to be irrational to reject an unfair offer? This leads to two other questions. First of all, if you were the gearhead over here, you're the rational actor. Could you ever justify the rejection of an unfair offer? You've, you've rejected an offer. You've foregone a gain. You've decided not to take money, which seems irrational. You had the choice between some money and no money, and you chose no money. Could you ever justify rationally why you would accept and why you would reject an unfair offer? The other part of the question is, what if the rejection of an unfair offer is purely emotional? Just through emotions, just through innate urges, you reject an unfair offer. Even though it was driven by your emotions, is it necessarily irrational? 
if you're automatically afraid of a vicious, hungry, growling tiger, is that irrational? No, it's perfectly rational to be afraid of a hungry tiger, even though that fear is coming from your emotions. So your emotions, your innate urges aren't necessarily irrational, right? They're not necessarily irrational. And rational decisions might not always seem rational superficially, but they might be rational under other circumstances. Maybe if you take a bigger picture into account. But let's say the decision to reject an unfair offer is purely emotional, purely innate, then would animals do that? An experiment actually sought to answer this question. It turns out that a troop of capuchin monkeys, in fact, all kinds of primates, including a troop of capuchin monkeys, is maintained at the Yerkes National Primate Center in Atlanta, Georgia. It's actually not an accident that this experiment on monkeys and the experiment on people were both initiated by groups from Emory University uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. It's one of the world's foremost research centers in behavioral economics. The monkeys had been taught to barter or trade tokens for food items. Now, the tokens, these are actually New York subway tokens. The tokens that the monkeys used were wooden because they'd probably break their, they probably gnaw on the tokens. They'd probably uh, break their teeth on these hard metal subway tokens. And they trade their tokens for food items with a human experiment. They, they don't trade the, the tokens with each other. They haven't gotten that far, but they do, they can learn to trade them with a human experimenter. So they learn that they, if they give a wooden token to a human experimenter, the human experiment will give them a treat. The monkeys are usually, usually quite happy to trade tokens for slices of cucumber, but they prefer grapes. They're willing to trade a token for a slice of cucumber, but they prefer to trade a token for a grape. Then in the experiment, pairs of monkeys exchange with a human experimenter in sight of one another. So the monkeys can see each other in this experiment, and that's an important aspect of it. Okay, so here are the details of this experiment, including the, the principal uh, results. This, was, this is in a paper by Brosnan and DeWall in Nature. This is your reading for the week. It's an excellent paper. This is your reading for the week. The results are a little bit complicated. Let's go through it. Basically, they break their experiment down into four separate tests. In the equality test, both monkeys get cucumber in exchange for a token, and both are pretty much happy to make the exchange and receive and eat the reward. In the equality test, the rate of, the rate of refusal to exchange the token or to, or to eat the reward is very low. So basically, both NT and RR are rejections of the offer. So the, the subject monkey, again, is the decider. And the decider can refuse to exchange a token or can exchange the token but refuse to accept and eat the reward. And both of these, are, both of these indicate rejection of the offer. So we can kind of lump them together. In the inequality test, the second test, one monkey gets grapes while the other still gets cucumber. In this case, the monkey receiving the cucumber, the decider monkey, will refuse to exchange or refuse the reward about half the time. So they're rejecting the offer about half the time. If the partner monkey gets grapes for a token when the subject monkey only gets cucumber for the token. In the effort control test, a grape is directly handed to one monkey, while the other monkey must still exchange a token for cucumber. In this case, the monkey receiving cucumber will refuse the exchange or the reward about 80% of the time. Now they're rejecting about 80% of the time. But in the food control case, only one monkey is involved, only the decider monkey is involved. Grapes, 
are placed on the spot where the partner monkey normally sat. In this case, the monkey receiving cucumber will refuse the exchange or the reward about half the time. So it's not quite so bad for him. And so here's the data. Again, NT and RR, this is refusal to exchange. NT is refusal to exchange the token. RR is refusal of the reward, refusal to eat the uh, reward. Um, and both of these, we lo are lumped together. So it's really the height of the bar that we're interested in here, the height of the bar, which indicates the rate of rejection, non-exchanges, the rate of rejection. And you can see that in the um, ET case, where both monkeys exchange the token for cucumber, the rate of rejection is very low. If the partner can exchange for grape, while the subject monkey still gets cucumber, well, now the rate of rejection goes up. It's about 50%. If the partner monkey doesn't even have to exchange a token and just get the grape for nothing, but the subject monkey still has to exchange a token for cucumber, now the rate of refusal of the, of the offer is very high. It's like 80%. If the partner monkey is absent and can't receive its rewards anyway, well, the subject monkey still refuses the offer about 50% of the time. This is fascinating. This is fascinating. It shows that non-human primates will reject unfair offers. And you can look up on the internet videos of these experiments. Two capuchin monkeys in cages inside of each other exchanging tokens for food items with, with human experimenters. In the case where the subject monkey has to exchange a token just for cucumber, and the partner monkey gets grapes, when it, when it pays for it with a token or not, the subject monkey will be disgusted. You can see their disgust. They'll, they won't just like ignore the reward. They'll pick up the cucumber and they'll throw it back at the human experimenter. They're really angry. It's fascinating to watch this behavior on the part of monkeys. It's also fascinating to see what happens over time. Because the performance of the monkeys changed as the test progressed in time. As the monkey receiving cucumber witnessed his partner exchanging for grape or receiving a grape without even to, having to exchange a token, it refused to exchange more and more. However, if it observed grapes being placed in the partner's absence, it began to refuse less and less. It would accept more and more. So the monkey's behavior changed over time. And here's the data. The black bar show the first 15 trials. The open bar show the last 10 trials. You can see that in the ET case, the monkey who can exchange for cucumber when the partner also exchanges for cucumber, the ET case, the fair case, the equal case, the um, rate of rejection was very low and it didn't change over time very much. In the IT case, the partner exchanges a token for grape. The subject monkey refused at first and refused even more as that unfair situation persisted. In the EC case, when its partner received grapes without even exchanging the token, yep, the refusal rate jumped up and it got even higher as that unfair situation persisted. But then in the um, FC case, where grapes were placed in, on the partner's seat with the partner absent, um, the rate of refusal actually started to go down when the monkey realized the partner monkey wasn't getting his reward anyway, so the subject monkey might as well get his cucumber. So this gives us another clue as to what's going on. First of all, if monkeys reject unfair offers, it suggests that the sense of fairness really is innate. Second, we see this temporal property that the rate of rejection could go up if unfair offers persisted. 
it's starting to show us that the rejection of unfair offers isn't necessarily irrational. Because think of the context like this experiment where the subject monkey can see the partner monkey. They're both from the same troop. They have to interact together all the time. They're social animals. They probably have to treat each other fairly. The subject monkey might have this innate urge to demand fair treatment so that it will share and share alike with the other members of its troop as time goes along, as they have to interact on a daily basis together in the same troop. It suggests that maybe monkeys in their normal behavior treat each other fairly, do they? Well, here's some more observations from the Yerkes Primate Institute. These are observations from Franz Duval the second author on the Brosnan Duval paper, which is your reading for the week. Here's a very nice picture of two capuchin monkeys. The bigger one is, is older and more dominant, stronger. The smaller one is subordinate. The larger monkey is munching on a monkey, business, a bi monkey biscuit. I used to work with monkeys and uh, I tried to eat a monkey biscuit one time. Horrible, but monkeys like them. And this larger capuchin monkey is munching on a monkey bis biscuit, and the smaller subordinate one would like to have some. So he goes over to the larger monkey, cups his hand around the larger monkey's hand, and holds the larger monkey's hands against its cheek, essentially begging for some monkey biscuit. Now the larger monkey does not have to share his biscuit. The larger monkey doesn't have to share. He's bigger and stronger. He could just push the smaller monkey away. But after a little bit of begging, the larger monkey will share his biscuit with the smaller monkey. Here's a group of, of chimpanzees. This is the alpha male in the group. These are two subordinate females. In this experiment, Franz Duval threw a whole watermelon into the enclosure. The big male went over, he picks up the watermelon and literally breaks it right in half and starts eating the watermelon. Immediately, the subordinate females run over to him and they start chattering at him. And before too long, he sits down and he shares his watermelon with them. In yet another experiment, a branch with tender leaves is thrown into the enclosure. No matter which chimpanzee first picks it up, they pick up the branch and they carry it to the alpha males of troop, and they all sit around and share the leaves. Not equally, according to status in the troop. So the alpha males get the most leaves. The littlest monkeys get the least leaves. They're portioned out according to position in the troop, but they're still portioned out to everyone. All of the chimps in the group get some leaves. All of the chimps get some watermelon. All of the capuchin monkeys get some monkey biscuit. They share. Non-human primates share. They share and share alike. Here's a really nice experiment, observation of Franz de Ball. When a branch covered with tender leaves is dropped into a baboon enclosure near some subordinate female baboons, they don't eat the leaves, but they carry the branch over to the dominant males of their troop. And the dominant males sit down and share out the leaves according to rank, but they're apportioning them out to everyone nevertheless. And so this relates back to human beings. where the alpha male exists, but is not a complete despot. The alpha male is not a tyrant. He can't be because he depends on the other members of his troop, of his tribe to survive in a hunter-gatherer society. Everybody matters. Everybody has to help. They have to help one another to, to survive. Here's a bunch of men in a hunter-gatherer tribe. They just had a kill and they're sharing the meat. They're cooking and sharing the meat. It doesn't matter which one of them killed the gazelle. They're all sharing the meat between each other and even with their dogs. The alpha male isn't a despot. He might get the biggest share, but he's sharing it out with everybody. 
According to anthropologist Christopher Bohem, rebellions against alpha male despotism created hunter-gatherer hunter egalitarianism that humans have maintained for 100,000 years. We, we're social animals and we have to cooperate together. Yes, people have different status, but they can't be despots. They can't be tyrants. According to Christopher Bohem, egalitarianism grew out of a compromise between two tendencies that humans and other primates share. Number one, we want to dominate, and number two, we don't want to be dominated. We all want to be the boss, but we don't want to be bossed around. So the sense of fairness, the sense of egalitarianism evolved, not only in us, but it's already present in our primate cousins. A sense of fairness that not only do we feel that we should be treated fairly, but we have the urge to treat others fairly. We demand a fair offer and we're willing to extend a fair offer to others. And this sense is probably innate. And it persists. It probably, it, it showed up uh, in hunter-gatherer societies where all human groups came from, but it persists in our modern industrialized culture. Here's some interesting results by Robert Frank, the, the famous behavioral economist, Robert Frank. This is published in the American Economic Review, available to you for free download as U of I students. Frank found in many companies that the most productive workers are paid substantially less than if they were paid in proportion to their productivity, while the least productive members are paid substantially more. In other words, if you're working in a real estate agency and you earn 90% of the commissions in that agency, you're not gonna get 90% of the pay. Your pay isn't gonna be proportionally higher than the other people in the agency. Yes, it will be higher. And yes, you will have higher status. And yes, you'll get a higher share and you'll get a nicer office and you might get your own assistant. But you're not gonna be rewarded in proportion to your earnings. Other people will get substantially more than if they were paid according to their earnings. Similarly, when one member of a pair of workers doing the same job gets a pay cut, the worker whose pay was cut decreases their effort by more than twice as much as when both workers' pay is cut. In other words, if we're working together selling ice cream cones and we know we're both getting paid the same, we're gonna work pretty hard. We'll make sure we're scooping out our ice cream cones. We're getting paid, you know, the boss is gonna dock us if we're not productive. But let's say the boss comes along and reduces both our pay. Well, we're gonna work a little less hard, but we're still, gonna, we're still gonna put forward an effort. What if the boss comes along, and even though we've both, both been working equally hard, he reduces your pay a lot, your pay a lot, and he doesn't reduce mine. Now you're gonna work much, much less, more than twice as much less than if we both got a pay cut. Why? Because you're being treated unfairly, and you're essentially demanding to be treated fairly. And why would you do that? Probably to establish a reputation as someone who demands to be treated fairly. That to some extent, we're social animals. We depend on others for our survival. We interact with each other on a, on a repeated basis. And uh, we have to establish a norm of fairness and equality so that we are treated fairly and so that everyone else in our group is treated fairly. There's more to the story. We'll continue in part two.